Well, good morning. I'm Tim Sheehy, president of the Metropolitan Milwaukee Association of Commerce. MMAC envisions a globally competitive region that fosters high value employment to sustain a vibrant quality of life for all. For the past nine months, we've been hosting this podcast, Business Strategies During the Pandemic. We certainly had no idea it would be topical this long. But what's clear nine months in is that many of the strategies we've developed during the pandemic are now embedded as forward-looking business practices. How we work has changed, how we learn has changed. So what does all this portend for Milwaukee's livability? That's what we're going to discuss with our guests today. Professor Ling Shan Hu, who is chair of the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee uh, Department of Urban Planning, a well-respected institution. Bob Monnet, senior partner of the Mandel Group, one of the most respected development firms in the region and Aaron Wren, urban analyst, consultant, and author of the Heartland Intelligence Research Briefing have all joined us. But before we get to our panel, we'll get an update from Dr. Raymond, president of the Medical College, a steadfast and facts first healthcare leader whom we are grateful to have as a regular contributor to this program. But first, a note from our sponsors. Today's program is sponsored by United Healthcare. In times like these, a traditional health plan may not be the best fit for your business. So take a look, closer look at our All Savers alternate funding from United Healthcare. MMAC has partnered with United Healthcare to offer coverage to groups between five and 99 employees. Now small businesses can take advantage of the benefits typically reserved for larger companies. Underwriting for more competitive pricing, better data, so your business understands where your premium dollars are going and a potential surplus refund if claims are lower than expected. Contact your MMAC broker or visit uhc.com backslash MMAC to learn more. And to thank you again to Spaces, which is serving as MMAC's temporary home during our office relocation. With over 3,000 global locations and 10 in Wisconsin, Spaces makes it easy to have a productive day at work. So again, thank you to our sponsors and Dr. Raymond, I'll turn it over to you for an update on uh, where we are today with COVID and where we're headed. Thank you and good morning, Tim, and hello, everyone. I hope that you're all well. If we can go to the first slide, please, Chris. Uh, next one, thank you. Wisconsin continues to be an epicenter of COVID-19 in the United States, as we have been for over a month. According to the New York Times COVID-19 Metro Tracker, as of yesterday, Wisconsin had four of the top 20 metro areas in the US in terms of worst burden of new cases per 100,000 population. Now that's down from 11 areas last week. And those include Beaver Dam, Eau Claire, Wausau Weston, and Fond du Lac, as well as nearby Dubuque, Iowa. Now more than a dozen Wisconsin metro areas have fallen out of the top 20 recently. One Wisconsin metro area, Sheboygan, is on the top 20 list of bad news ahead metro areas where cases are increasing the fastest. And that's down from eight last week. Wisconsin still has four of the metro areas with the highest burden of disease since the beginning of the pandemic, Beaver Dam, Green Bay, Oshkosh, Nina, and Fond du Lac, and Dubuque is number nine. Now the Great Lakes and upper Midwest uh, states continue to surge and the Sun Belt now also is surging in terms of the pandemic. Now, some of these trends might seem favorable, but please understand that we don't have fewer top 20 hotspots in Wisconsin because we're doing better. Rather, the states in the Great Lakes region, the upper Midwest, and the Sun Belt have caught up to us and in some cases have surpassed us. For example, North Dakota now has the most active cases per capita in the entire world. Now, despite the rise in other states, Wisconsin consistently has been in the top five for daily new cases for the last month. Next slide, please. Now, this next slide needs little explanation. The screen grab from the Wisconsin DHS website yesterday shows that 65 counties in Wisconsin have critically high levels of COVID-19 activity, and the remaining seven have very high activity. DHS added the critically high designation last week to show counties that have case burdens 
that exceed 1,000 per 100,000 population. And Barry High is characterized as 350 per 100,000. And Wisconsin as a whole is significantly over 1,000 cases per 100,000 population. Next slide, please. This next slide is a summary of testing data. Cumulatively, we have tested, as of yesterday, 2.3 million people in Wisconsin and just over 377,000 in Milwaukee. We've had 317,000 positive cases in Wisconsin and 56,000 in Milwaukee. Our daily testing capacity has increased to over 59,000 per day with 130 laboratories now testing. Now shifting to the right side of the slide, daily positive tests have been trending very unfavorably in Wisconsin over the last month. Yesterday, there were 4,389 new cases reported in Wisconsin and 567 in Milwaukee. But the highest single day ever in Wisconsin was last Friday at 7,777 new cases. And the single day high for Milwaukee also was last Friday at 1,097. And as you can see in the fine print on the bottom right, our daily case counts are rising rapidly. They first exceeded 2,000 on September 17th, 3,000 on October 8th, 4,000 on October 20th, 5,000 on October 27th, 6,000 on November 5th, and 7,000 on November 7th. And we've had many days since November 7th where we've exceeded 7,000. Now the average case positivity rates over the last seven days in Wisconsin and Milwaukee were 36.4% and 32.3% respectively. These are alarmingly high and suggest that there is a significant burden of undiagnosed COVID-19 cases, both in the state and in the Milwaukee area. And to put this into perspective, New York has graded interventions that kick in when they exceeded 2%, 3%, and 5%. Next slide, please. This slide shows various hospital indicators. Now we've had 14,499 admissions with COVID-19 to Wisconsin hospitals since the beginning of the pandemic through yesterday. The likelihood of hospitalization with a positive diagnosis of COVID-19 continues to trend favorably as we learn more about the disease, now at 4.6%. And as of yesterday, we set a new high with 2,274 patients in Wisconsin hospitals with a diagnosis of COVID-19. This is a week over week increase of 271 inpatients. Fully 20% of all Wisconsin hospital beds currently are occupied by patients with COVID-19. And there's a similar trend with COVID-19 ICU admissions. Wisconsin reached a new high census of 456 yesterday with a week over week increase of 60 and 31% of the ICU beds in Wisconsin currently are occupied by COVID-19 patients. ICU bed availability continues to drop significantly and as of yesterday was only 168. Now many hospitals have activated internal surge capacity, which is beginning to place a strain on recovery rooms, step down units and procedure rooms. And 89% of all certified ICU beds in Wisconsin currently are occupied. Now this is slightly better than last week when we reached a peak of 92% of every ICU bed being occupied. Available ventilator capacity is copious and should never be a limiting factor for caring for COVID-19 patients. Although the number of available ventilators has decreased to 1,751. PPE supplies continue to worsen, especially for paper masks and gowns. And I would note that although the PPE supply chains have all improved since March, they're still fragile and we can't take them for granted. Next slide, please. Hospitalizations are rising in all seven healthcare emergency coalition regions. COVID-19 hospitalizations are at or near all time highs for all seven regions. And you can see the numbers there for each of the regions. COVID-19 ICU admissions also are rising or peaking in six of the healthcare emergency readiness coalition regions. And ICU admissions are at or near all time highs for Wisconsin and for six of the HERC regions, including Southeastern Wisconsin. 
And ICU censuses are high in six healthcare emergency readiness coalition regions, which you can see there. And those range from the mid 80s up into the low 90s. I also want to say COVID-19 hospitalizations continue to rise nearly exponentially. ICU admissions are rising more slowly, but they are at all time high levels of 209 here in southeastern Wisconsin. Now, I always clarify that most of the patients in the ICUs do not have COVID-19, but a surge of COVID-19 patients who require intensive care places a strain on our ability to take care of all of our patients. Next slide, please. This next slide just shows the COVID-19 trends for hospitalizations since the beginning of the pandemic, shown in the dark blue plots, and ICU admissions shown in the light blue plots. The trend lines for southeastern Wisconsin's 29 hospitals are shown on the left, and for Wisconsin's 134 hospitals are shown on the right. And as you can see, these trends are very troubling. I would also add that most health systems have activated internal ICU surge capacity, but that staff remain our limiting factor. Many are out because they're infected with COVID-19 or are in quarantine due to a documented exposure. And we cannot expect to recruit healthcare workers from other parts of the country because COVID-19 is surging nearly everywhere in the US. Next slide, please. This slide summarizes uh, key data since the beginning of the pandemic. 77% of the patients diagnosed with COVID-19 are categorized as recovered. And what that means is that they have either had a resolution of their symptoms or they're 30 days out from their initial diagnosis. I would note that many of those patients categorized as recovered have not recuperated their pre-COVID-19 state of health. Indeed, approximately 30% of those patients are estimated to have long COVID or to be what is termed long haulers. 22.2% of the cases are currently active and the death rate continues to go down now at 0.8% in Wisconsin. That's better than the death rate in the US which is hovering about 2%, but we expect by the end of the pandemic that the case fatality rate is going to be somewhere around 0.7%. Cumulative deaths in Wisconsin now are at 2,649, with 575 of those occurring in Milwaukee. And the daily number of deaths clearly is rising in Wisconsin and in Milwaukee. And as I typically say, we should note in the middle of the slide that deaths disproportionately affect people and communities of color, but COVID-19 can be fatal for anyone. And as you can see, the majority of deaths in Wisconsin are among people who self-identify as white. And this is particularly important in rural, less populated areas of the state. Shifting to the right, the doubling time for positive tests is 40.8 days in Wisconsin and 68.1 days in Milwaukee. And these trends are moving unfavorably. And I would note with such a high burden of disease in the state, doubling that in 41 days is not good. The seven-day growth rates of positive tests are at 2.2% in Wisconsin and 1.7% in Milwaukee, and the same caveat applies uh, as with the uh, doubling times. The reproductive numbers also remain unfavorable at 1.07 in both Wisconsin and in Milwaukee. Uh, next slide, please, Chris. I'd just like to summarize before I go on to vaccine progress, a couple of key takeaway points. New cases continue to rise at a rapid rate across every region of Wisconsin. Wisconsin's case burden is very high, exceeding 1,000 per 100,000 population. COVID-19 hospitalizations are at all time highs. The daily census levels for Wisconsin are greater than sevenfold what we experienced just two months ago. ICU censuses also are at all time high levels and the daily censuses now exceed fivefold what we experienced two months ago. Daily reported deaths from COVID-19 are rising are at all time high levels with seven day average Wisconsin deaths at sevenfold what we experienced just two months ago. Hospitals are nearing capacity and the seven day average of use of hospital beds and ICU beds in Wisconsin is about 90%. Staff are out across the state either due to COVID-19 infections or exposures. Our alternative care facility, however, does have capacity 
There were only 19 patients at the West Dallas Fairgrounds facility as of yesterday. And I would note that the ACF has upgraded from army cots to hospital beds and is able to provide higher levels of care now than they were even a week ago. And I'd like to commend the leadership of the ACF for their commitment to excellence and for the outstanding partnership that they've shown for all the hospitals in Wisconsin. Now, there are noteworthy indications that our health systems are nearing capacity. I'm sure most of you know that Advocate Aurora announced reductions in elective procedures by 50%, and I know other health systems are considering reductions in elective procedures. I also wanna note that Children's Wisconsin announced yesterday that they're prepared to take care of adult patients up to age 26 as overflow from other health systems. Now, to be clear, Children's Wisconsin will not accept patients who have COVID-19 or influenza, but they're there to help other health systems free up bed capacity. Now I'd like to switch to another topic on this slide. And on the next few slides, I'd like to focus on the good news about COVID-19 vaccines. So just to answer the question that's been repeatedly asked since the beginning of the pandemic, will we have a COVID-19 vaccine in the US by the end of 2020? Um, yes, uh, but probably this is going to be limited to frontline healthcare providers, first responders, and high-risk populations. For example, Pfizer, which announced the success of their early vaccine trials last Monday, estimate that they can have 15 to 20 million doses available by the end of the year. Now, recruitment was initially slowed for all four of our phase three vaccine trials in the U.S. because of the deceleration of the pandemic in August and early September, but that's picked up very briskly in October and November and actually will help us establish the safety profiles and the effectiveness of the vaccines in the U.S. more quickly than we would have anticipated even a month ago. I also want to point out that no single drug company is going to be able to meet the short-term demand for our general population. We're going to need hundreds of millions of doses of COVID-19 vaccines. If I could go to the next slide, and this is really a, an important issue here. Will COVID-19 vaccines be safe? I, I think the short, short answer is yes, um, but we all have to note that the usual development time frame for a vaccine has been compressed from 12 years to somewhere between 10 and 12 months. Now, nine vaccine manufacturers signed a vaccine pledge on September 8th to guarantee that they would work with the FDA to make sure that their products before they came to market were as safe as possible. But it's important to note, we won't have long-term safety data on these vaccines until late 2021. In fact, Pfizer plans to continue their study for two years to establish the, the safety of their vaccine. Now, we did see that vaccine makers are showing caution during development. They have paused studies to assess potential risks, which is very responsible. But I would say that confidence in the FDA's historical independence as a gold standard international regulatory body has been eroded. And if you superimpose that on legitimate concerns about the compressed time frame for vaccine development and the already existing baseline of anti-vaccine sentiments, this is going to pose a difficult challenge for us in terms of getting the population immunized. And finally, I wanna note that the first vaccine to market ultimately might not be the best vaccine that we end up with. If I could go to the next slide, please. This slide simply shows the nine signatories of the Vaccine Manufacturers Pledge. And I wanna note that these are the leaders in developing COVID-19 vaccines for the Western world. And next slide, please. Now, I'm certain that all of you are aware of two very promising announcements in the last eight days of greater than 90% effectiveness of two COVID-19 vaccine candidates from Pfizer-BioNTech, which was announced last week, and Moderna, which was announced yesterday. In many ways, these two announcements are arguably the best news of 2020. Now, the news is exciting for several reasons. The initial success of these vaccines validates the new approach of using modified messenger RNA in vaccines. This technology previously has not been used in human vaccines. Next, the two vaccines validate that the COVID-19 spike protein, which COVID-19 uses to invade mammalian cells, is a suitable target for vaccine development. And this is important because most of the vaccines 
that are in phase two and phase three trials target that spike protein. And finally, the vaccines both appear to be very safe. I also wanna say that the vaccines are much more effective than was anticipated. Many experts were hoping for early indications of a 50% effectiveness, and it's remarkable that the first two candidates had greater than 90% effectiveness. Now, I do wanna caution everybody, that effectiveness was measured starting one week after receiving the second vaccination. Uh, all these vaccines coming to market, except for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, are two jab vaccines that need to be given either 21 or 28 days apart. So we really don't know how durable this immunity is going to be, but the initial results are extraordinary. We also expect that two mRNA candidate vaccines will apply for emergency use authorization by the end of this month and could be available for distribution to frontline healthcare providers by December 31st. Now, the two adenovirus-based vaccines will complete phase three trials within weeks. So these are using an older technology and these are from Johnson & Johnson Janssen and AstraZeneca Oxford. Now, one major challenge to the Pfizer vaccine is that it requires ultra low temperatures posing significant logistical challenges. The supply chain to rural and sparsely populated areas is going to be particularly difficult. And those challenges also add to the potential cost of the vaccine. But fortunately, the Moderna vaccine and the two other candidates that are likely to come to market by the end of the year require more standard temperatures. In other words, they can be transported in standard freezers and stored in refrigerators. Um, and I think this is gonna be very important for us. It's also likely that three other vaccine candidates are going to enter the market in the US within the next several months because these are advanced phase trials and approvals in Europe. And those include Novavax and a Sanofi GSK fusion protein approach and CureVac mRNA vaccine. So with this good news comes some challenges, however. We're going to need to overcome vaccine skepticism in general and safety concerns about these vaccines if we hope to resume some semblance of a normal life in the second quarter of 2021. We'll need to understand that these vaccines will not conquer COVID-19 by themselves. Vaccinations will. In that regard, the United Nations and the Vaccine Confidence Project of the University of London announced earlier in the week that they've come together to form Team HALO, the goal of which is to counter vaccine misinformation. And over 100 prominent scientists have already agreed to join this critical initiative. If I can go to the next slide, this slide simply shows the data sources that we use for these presentations. And we've included also in several appendices for your reference if you wanna download the presentation. And in the appendices, you'll see detailed slides for the, co the four COVID-19 vaccines that are in phase three trials in the US. Also a framework for non-pharmacological interventions for individual COVID-19 risk reduction, a framework for community risk reduction for COVID-19, the social risk factors for COVID-19, and individual risk factors for COVID-19. So I'd like to thank all of you for your kind attention and turn it back over to Tim. Well, Dr. Raymond, thank you again for that uh, thorough update. Um, two kind of quick questions before we go to our panel. One is um, from a company here who had their first uh, positive when their first let's try that again no we got an echo got it okay got something on my screen here okay let's try this again <laughs> Um, one is from a company who had their first positive case two months ago uh, with a close contact exposure. They called 211 and were told that the exposed employee could test on the third day after exposure and if negative could return to work. Um, is that still valid or do we need to be waiting 14 days regardless of a negative test? Yeah, thanks, Tim. And I apologize to those who were not able to hear me because the volume was low. Hopefully this is, this is better. Um, 
Tim, there's no right way to do this. And what I would say is um, calling 211 or consulting with your local health department will give you the most current advice. So, so what do we know about the biology of COVID-19? We know that people can be asymptomatic for one or two, two days when they're most contagious uh, before they have symptoms. So that's the critical period. So testing three days after an exposure makes perfect sense. That's about the right time, three or four days after the exposure. Um, you're probably going to be negative if you test negative a day or two after that. So it sounds like the advice was good advice, but everyone needs to know that if you get a COVID-19 uh, test, it's probably just good for the next day or two because you, you could have subclinical levels of virus that the PCR test couldn't detect. And, and then the other question, Dr. Amond, is a recurring one about uh, comparing COVID to the flu and you know how many people die from the flu um, and, and where we are with COVID. Yeah, in a bad year for the flu, we have 60,000 deaths. And that's without the non-pharmacological interventions that we have. And, and most of those are imputed. They're actually not laboratory diagnosed influenza deaths. So we're already at 250,000 deaths with shutdowns and mask mandates and all these other interventions. Um, the in typical influenza has a mortality rate that's significantly less than 0.1%. And again, we're probably gonna settle out at a mortality rate case fatality rate of about 0.7% for COVID-19. Um, that's a lot of people. And I also wanna point out that up to a third of people that are, have quote unquote recovered from COVID-19 are struggling with long hauler syndrome. So it isn't just about the deaths, it's about the long-term side effects. And if people are focused on the economy, one thing that I think we should think about is how many of those people, the, the third that are long haulers, going to be on disability and unable to work. Good point. And then maybe a last question for you as everybody hang, uh, moves into the Thanksgiving holiday, what advice would you have for families gathering? Well, this won't be popular because I know that all of us are hungering for co human contact, especially with those that we love, but you should minimize the number of people that you interact with. Um, we're doing a virtual Thanksgiving dinner by Zoom. It's not fun, we miss our kids and our family. Um, but look, we have light at the end of the tunnel. What we do now is gonna determine how well we're doing six weeks from now. And I think everybody through these holiday seasons just needs to look forward to the vaccines and trying to get back to a new normal in the second quarter of 2021. Well, Dr. Raymond, I'll take that as advice to sit in my chair by myself and watch football alone, I love it. All right. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you um, very much, Dr. Raymond. Appreciate the update as always. Um, <clears throat> I want to turn now to our uh, panel uh, um, that we've got with us, Bob Minot, who's the senior partner at Mandel Group. Again, one of the most respected development firms in the region. Aaron Wren, urban analyst, consultant, author of the Heartland Intelligence Briefing, and uh, Pro Professor Ling Wan Hu, chair of the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee's Department of Urban Planning. So um, I'm going to engage all of you three uh, together in a discussion. Um, and as we talked about this in, in the beginning, COVID has certainly changed the way we work, the way we're learning, um, and it's going to have an impact on how we live uh, in Milwaukee. And uh, as I think about this, um, some of this impact is clearly going to be temporary. And I'm interested in your insights on how this is going to alter how we function as a region and as a city and as a community on a long-term basis. Um, I'm in the midst of reading what I think is a fascinating and timely book by Ben Wilson called Metropolis. Uh, and it's a history of the city, which he calls humankind's greatest invention. Um, and he notes uh, that by 2025, cities will, which account for 7% of the world's population will account for 50% of the world's gross domestic product and every day 200,000 people move into an urban area. So I'd like your help uh, exploring kind of what you think COVID means to how we live. Um, and I'll just start that with an opening question and uh, maybe Aaron, start with you uh, just to give me your thoughts as you've been thinking about what this means 
uh, to um, urban markets and into metro areas and, and what you see uh, as a lasting impact from COVID? Yes, the first thing it's important to keep in mind is that often the obvious prediction we would make about the future uh, in, in response to something turns out to be completely wrong. And I keep going back to 9-11 attack in New York. You would have thought after 9-11, New York was gonna be dead. And it's like, it's gonna take a long time to rebuild. Terrorism risk is going to make it uh, too costly or risky to do business there. People aren't gonna to wanna to live there. But in fact, the decade after 9-11 was far better in New York than the decade before 9-11. And so uh, I'm not saying 9-11 caused things to get better, but it didn't have the negative impact on the city that you thought. So any trends that we have are pretty provisional. Um, what I would say is that COVID has accelerated some trends and um, maybe, maybe interrupted some others that provide opportunities for cities like Milwaukee. In terms of what it's accelerated, obviously accelerated income and racial inequality, which we've seen all the data around the economic impacts of the, uh, of the uh, virus. Also, it has accelerated the move towards remote work, which has been slowly building for decades. Uh, even pre-COVID, more people work remotely in the United States than take public transit to work, uh, which is sort of a new, a new thing. But what's been, I think, interrupted, uh, it, it, one is a negative for Milwaukee, one is a positive. One is that downtowns had really been doing very, very well. And downtown sort of took a pie in the face uh, during, during COVID. I mean, they're basically completely dead. And so I think how cities fare like Milwaukee, a lot of which is gonna determine by how well downtown is able to bounce back as an employment center you know, for events, et cetera. The second one is sort of, that's been reversed and maybe more positive for Milwaukee is that these coastal cities had really been concentrating a disproportionate share of high value economic activity. Something like 4%, four cities in America accounted for like 80% of all venture capital investment. And some of those cities, notably New York and San Francisco, have been among the most affected um, in, in negatively by, by COVID. Um, just more and more research on like how many people have left New York City, for example. And if you're spending your time in a lockdown, you don't want to be spending it in a one bedroom apartment. I, I moved back from, from New York City to Indianapolis uh, in December and very glad to be sitting here in a home right now and not in my one bedroom apartment trying to work and do this with a, a three-year-old and my wife in there. So uh, this has not affected the places like Milwaukee. Um, urban real estate markets in most of these cities are still pretty much on fire from what I've seen. I'm not as familiar specifically with that. So I think there's an opportunity uh, for Milwaukee to seek to benefit from these ex potential exodus, at least in the short term, from some of these coastal cities. We'll see what happens in the long term. And then to attempt to benefit from this remote work trend that may allow you to pick up some of those residents um, if you're able to sell them on this as a place to live. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Bob, let me turn to you next. Um, you're doing this on a daily basis, investing in the future, um, building places where people live. Um, how, how are you thinking about this going forward? Well, uh, before I start, um, Tim, uh, Dr. Raymond's presentation is always so spectacular. It is such a, it's the best news uh, delivery on COVID that, uh, uh, that we get. So thank you, Dr. Raymond. Um, I, I mean, I, you know, the, our business is really based on demographics and regardless of uh, things such as 9-11, the great recession, and now COVID-19, um, the housing business that we're in, um, and we run about 6,000, uh, 6,500 apartments. We have eight or 9,000 people living with us um, in several different cities. But housing is such a basic necessity that um, that it, to some extent, it will um, it'll transcend uh, some of the uh, economic uh, you know speed bumps in the road uh, like COVID-19. But um, if you look at at overall trends, and if you look at it relative to the health of the city. You know, just just imagine yourself living your life going forward without ever having the benefit of all of the attributes and diversions of urban living, um, and you know all the places you go to, all the events you see, all the restaurants. Just assume that's all gone, and you you'll begin to immediately say, 
yeah, you know, I understand it's bad now, but this is going to come back and there's going to be some blood on the tracks. There are going to be businesses that are closed, but, you know, looking at housing now, um, there's, um, there are some, you know, there's some mega trends that we're now seeing coming out of the, of the buildup of COVID-19. I think the, 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 um, the trend that we're seeing right now overall in the marketplace, and this is urban and suburban, is we've seen a fairly um, dramatic drop off in, um, in leasing activity and occupancy just in the last 45 days. So you're seeing uh, concessions coming into our marketplace, but they're nowhere near the sorts of things that you read about in Midtown Manhattan, where um, you know economic uh, economics of renting in Midtown Manhattan is probably a 15 to 20 percent discount, um, uh, whereas here there might be a seven or eight percent discount on cost of living in, in apartments. So that's that's one thing. But on the on the flip side of that, um, as measured by our our current lease up activity. Um, we just we finished probably the most robust lease up in our history in West Dallas, um, with the last quarter of that lease up directly in the midst of COVID-19. Um, we're leasing up a new property in uh, Franklin right now, and we're leasing apartments at a rate of 20 a month at that one location. And so there's still economic activity out there, but um, and there's still demand, and there's still a, you know, there's still a rebalancing of of um, of housing preferences and the like. But for us, life goes on. I think multifamily is the least affected of all the asset classes in real estate. We're collecting 98 to 98 and a half percent of all rents that we're charging every month. And so uh, people put a preference, you know, budgetarily on what their needs are. Housing is a primary need. And um, so I, I think that, uh, you know, the good news is that the, uh, the vaccines are coming along and um, as Dr. Raymond implies, I think, you know, mid-year next year, things are going to start returning to normal. And it will be like post 9-11 where we say, oh, yeah, I've got to take my shoes off at the airport. But otherwise, all my restaurants are open and, and I'm having a good time. Yeah, thank you. Professor Hu, using your urban planning background, what, what should we be thinking about uh, in, in the coming years? What, what has COVID really changed? Or is this kind of a um, and I don't want me to make light of people losing their lives. This is a speed bump in our planning cycle. Um, thank you, Tim. And I guess there are a few trends that we all agree upon. And there is so much uncertainty that we're exploring together. So the trends we agree upon is that working from home is going to become the trend. Uh, employers and employees and our families think it's a feasible idea and we can do that. And I also think that we agree that cities are very resilient. So over the history, we have crisis, we have 9-11, we have health, other kind of pandemics, epidemics, um, cities survive. So cities will prosper in the future. Um, now, I want to say that there is one uncertainty all of us are thinking about and questioning about. We don't know exactly where cities are going. What I mean is that cities will look feel and probably function very differently from now, from what we see today. Um, I want to just touch base a little bit on my own research on working from home. Um, it's telecommuting, it's, it's what we call uh, um, work from home or job housing balance, or I'm sorry, uh, work, work life balance. Um, my own research on working from home a few years ago before pandemic is that actually people reduce commuting to work, but they use the time they saved from commuting on something else. They didn't reduce their travel to other activities. They actually increase travel. So in that sense, people reduce going to work, which saves time, saves money, saves some of the uh, oil consumption, but at the same time, people want to spend more time with family, going to restaurants, going to uh, social events, going to museums, for example. So after the pandemic, after COVID-19 is over, if more of us adopt work, working from home or telecommuting, we can imagine or we can ex expect how home-based or household activities going to different kind of uh, social events, recreational events will increase. In other words, cities need to accommodate 
all those different needs for people. And I think during this pandemic, people also realized access to healthcare is so important. And uh, Dr. Raymond just showed that uh, the mortality rate is high in rural areas. So cities has one advantage. Of course, the spread of disease is faster in cities, but at the same time, cities have better services, healthcare services and other uh, needed services like education, et cetera, et cetera. And I think a nice thing, let's come back to Milwaukee a little bit. A nice thing about Milwaukee and uh, our region is that we also have a very good uh, park system and open space. So during the pandemic, people cannot travel. We're not going to work. We're not going to restaurants. We see the trend that people use all those trails, open, open spaces a lot. So that value is significant. And Milwaukee has well advantage in, in that. A lot of open spaces and nice park system. So Milwaukee has all those advantages in terms of providing the services and amenities. I want to mention one, one challenge that I believe Milwaukee faces. And if I can use uh, Professor Richard Florida's framework, he talks about creative class and to attract creative class. So when he says creative class, we people usually understand it as professional and business services. And this class or professional business service workers will grow for sure because that industry is growing in the United States. And he said to attract creative class, cities need three T's. Talents, Milwaukee has. Technology, we can talk about it. And the third T is tolerance. He used the words tolerance. And I think nowadays we understand it as inclusion and diversity. This is one part that Milwaukee can improve upon. And we all know that um, different skills, like by different research, Milwaukee is one of the most segregated city in the United States and they attract media attention. And that's one challenge or that's one issue that Milwaukee needs to tackle to attract talents into Milwaukee. So that's basically um, my see of the trends. We need to build a places to live, work, play, and at the same time address social justice in Milwaukee. Thank you very much, Professor Aaron. Put your con consulting hat on and, and look at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So as we just think about one of the things that Professor Wu talked about is more people working at home. Now, maybe they won't work five days a week, but they work two to three days a week. What, what does that mean to how we um, develop you, you know, future spaces? Yeah, I would say for um, Milwaukee, the real, the real question I think on the work from home is going to be, what does it mean for these major office parks and for um, major downtown employers? Because the downtown employment base has really been an economic engine um, for a lot of these cities containing a lion's share of the high value employment in many cases, um, that plus wherever the hospitals uh, tend to be located. And so I think to the extent that, you know, suburbanites who previously commuted downtown don't come downtown anymore, um, that I think is a challenge um, and to the city. I think if we look at a world of remote work, what you see with remote work is remote work increases the importance of place in the attraction of uh, talent and residents. So it used to be that you, know, you got a great company, it's in downtown uh, Milwaukee or it's in a, in a suburban community and they hire employees and those employees kind of have to be in the office, right? So you moved to Milwaukee because that's where you got a job out of college, right? Why did I move to Chicago out of college? Because uh, that's where I got a job. To the extent that jobs are no longer tied to the physical location of the office, it lets someone uh, disaggregate the place where they live from, the, from essentially the place, if you will, where they work. And so you can, you can live wherever you want. And so to attract people to your city, you're no longer gonna be able to just rely on your premium employers or, or whatnot. You're going to have to sell the place. So the place is gonna become much more important. And what I would see as the 
uh, you know, the advantages of a place like Milwaukee, obviously the lakefront is superb. You've got a lot of great historic neighborhoods. I think the killer app of uh, this, this goes against, I mean, a lot, a lot of urbanist people don't like me when I say this, the killer app of Milwaukee class cities is the single family home. And the fact that in a lot of these cities, you can own a house and it's not just like a New York city where you live there if you're super rich or for certain stages of your life, a place like Milwaukee can attract people at all stages of life um, because of its because of the the home products that are available. Yes, there's apartments, but when you're when you have the family, you want a house, you can have a house. And so I think there's a lot of advantages that it has very close to Chicago. Take the train down and take advantage of the cultural options there. Where I think you really need to focus uh, on Milwaukee is ensuring that in an, you know when there's fiscal stress put on the city as a result of the coronavirus, that your public services and levels of public investment do not diminish because when you have those diminished qualities, quality of place and public services, uh, it's gonna affect your desirability. I think it's gonna be fiscal stress is gonna be something that's affecting a lot of places. And specifically where it's gonna affect Milwaukee, one area I wanna focus on is your bus system because Milwaukee actually has a very high ridership bus system relative to cities in its size class in the region you know, so 3X the right, even after significant declines in bus ridership in Milwaukee, you're three times the ridership of Indianapolis. You're, you know, 50% higher than Columbus, Ohio. You've got a bus system with a lot of ridership. Um, trans is very important to your city. Trans is very important to equity and, and therefore ensuring that your transit systems, which are taking big budget cuts because of, you know, the, the fares and this and that uh, can really navigate through this without diminution in service levels is one that I would particularly zero in on. Yeah, Bob, I want you to react to what Aaron uh, said, made some really interesting points. Again, um, we've got a good bus transit system. We've got a relatively new transit system. Um, they're going to be stressed with less revenue, less ridership. Um, presumably, the downtown footprint companies don't need as large a space as they had. So, so again, how do you think about this from the perspective of looking ahead for Milwaukee? Well, uh, man, from a personal experience of working from home, and maybe, uh, Chris, you've got a couple of images from me if you bring up the first one. Um, the, you know, the first thing I think about on this work from home issue is, um, is who is it that's in the workforce today and, and how are they going to react to um, working from home versus how I'm reacting from it? I've got two 24-year-old sons in Chicago um, who are working out of their bedrooms in their apartment that they share. And, uh, and I'm wondering, you know, now that, now that you have millennials as have being really the largest generation in the labor force, how are those younger workers going to um, uh, be uh, indoctrinated into the companies? How are they going to interact with the old guys, Tim, like you and me? Um, and you know where are they going to where are they going to get the um, kind of the historical background and that that daily you know multiple touch um, uh, guidance in terms of building their careers? They are not going to get it sitting in their bedroom. So I think companies are going to come to realize that if they really want to um, if they really want to see productivity out of their talent, they're going to have to figure out a way to grow their talent. Um, that replicates the benefits that that younger talent pool receives when they interact with older um, uh, age sets, older generations in the office workplace. So I, I really, I, I am not a huge fan of work from home. Um, of course, I, I have, I, I get on my bike and in 15 minutes I'm at the office, so I don't have a one hour commute. I might think differently if I lived out in Hartford or West Bend or something. But, um, you know, with regard to the work from home issue and uh, overall productivity of companies, I, I really feel that, um, uh, and maybe it's uh, self-centered, but I feel there's a lot for us to give to these younger, the younger workforce. And I think that's gonna be a huge stumbling block um, for companies going forward. Um, uh, Aaron made a really good point about housing. So I'd like to go to the second image, uh, Chris, if I could. And, um, and you know, part, part, part of what happens when you, get, when you have a disruptor like COVID-19, is that it tends to emphasize um, things that are already happening. And one of the things that's already happening is that this massive millennial generation is actually you know, falling off. We've already hit peak millennial. And a lot of these uh, 
a lot of these millennials that we think of as young guys, um, those on the call in Milwaukee, how can you not know Ian Apston? He's got the best PR group working for him in the city. So you got these millennials, you know, that formed organizations like Milwaukee. They're all in their mid to later 30s now, and, and they're all getting married, having kids. And of course, there's a natural progression for them to want to move, as Aaron said, single family housing. And, uh, you know, single family housing could be the antithesis of urban revitalization in some respects, but Milwaukee is blessed with the fact that it has really great close in suburbs with really terrific sidewalk neighborhoods that have suddenly become pretty darned expensive to break into. So, uh, but there is, if you look at the trend of single family versus multifamily households, we, you know, we bottomed out on single, at the end of the recession, about 61% of households nationally um, were in single family homes. That was down from a high of 69%. So that was the erosion of home ownership during the recession. We're now back up to about 65%. So we've kind of crept back up, even in the context of a very slow new construction, uh, single family new construction economy. But now you're seeing lots of, of pressure to build more new single family housing the, the, and the interesting challenge is going to be is that as this millennial uh, uh, family forming generation pushes through the system, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in terms of single family home building. If you can satisfy the, the aspirations of that group to have their kids ride a bike down the sidewalk in front of their house, can I do that with the land resources and the geography that's available to create those kinds of neighborhoods? So I, I think there's lots of interesting stuff going on. Um, I think that the um, that just there's this, this natural progression that's happening demographically has nothing to do with COVID. So there already was a trend starting um, in the uh, in uh, 2018, you know, starting back in 2017, 18, when millennials started to drop off, and they're the they're the main fuel for you know there's a baby boomer component, but they're but millennials are the main fuel for urban. Uh, urban repopulation, and I, I just think that we're going to we're going to see it more aggressively, uh, maybe because of COVID and some of the concerns about living in living in an urban environment. Um, just uh, if I could just anecdotally, um, uh, the urban versus rural issue. Um, I drove back from our cottage up north on Sunday during the Packers game. Um, I will tell you that every tavern I went by had ten or fifteen pickup trucks outside of it. Um, all the people were in the taverns watching the Packers game. So even though this sparse population, they all go to the same tavern, the same grocery store, the same gas station. I think you see a lot of red in sparsely populated areas because people congregate and, and maybe they're just not as uh, concerned about it as we are, uh, you know, some of us are. Um, so it's, there, there's no elixir, space is not necessarily the elixir when we're a social people and we, and we like to congregate together. Yeah, Professor, who, talk about again from an urban planning perspective, when I think about Milwaukee and you've got Marquette very close to the city, you've got your school, UWM, very close to the city, you have MSOE in the city. And again, as, as learning changes, are those campuses going to remain kind of the same size footprint? And, and what does that mean? Because they're all integral to kind of the experience in Milwaukee. Um. Our university, the campus is empty now, which is very sad. But I imagine that a lot of people, a lot of students and the faculty are getting used to online classes. So I imagine more and more classes will be online uh, in the future. And of course, that also has advantage, like our seminar now can reach out to broader audience. So when we have online lectures, we probably can reach out to more students and communities. Um, so if I can just put UWM campus and all those uh, high education physical campuses into the space. I want to echo what Aaron says. We need to build the place and the place needs to accommodate all these very diversified needs. Um, I'm thinking of breathing streets. So it's single family house, it's restaurants, it's bars, it's small offices. So that's pretty high density place in a very urbanized area provide a lot of services for people. And I imagine, just look at the history, I imagine that the shape, the physical environment, uh, the 
kind of the 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 spatial uh, structure of our cities will be changed. We change it from the first type of cities emerge as factories, cluster of factories, then getting into office buildings. And I'm imagining, and I'm looking into very, very long down the road into the future. Workplaces will be fragmented. Workplaces will be individualized and it needs to be flexible. I think Tim, your, your office right now is in spaces. That's kind of the, I imagine that's kind of a coworker shared office spaces. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the trend. So we probably in the down, in, in a very far future, we don't see so many office towers. We just see very uh, like modulized buildings. People can use it as home, as offices, as restaurants, as different functions. So cities might be changed in the future in terms of the spatial shapes. And I also want to echo uh, uh, Aaron's uh, discussion on transit as well. Um, Transportation can be individualized as well. And we know Uber, Lyft, all these. So transit agencies, we know um, MCTS is suffering a lot right now with budget, with low ridership. Um, there is discussion across the country about integrating transit with all those transportation network companies. So transit agencies still maintain the main service corridors. So that's high ridership corridors. They still can get revenue from all those high, high ridership. But for those low ridership routes, they probably can cooperate, collaborate with transportation network companies or micro transit companies and provide individualized, but also convenient services still at the same time affordable to people. Uh, so new technology can help us and we just need to be a little bit um, more open-minded and thinking about all those flexibility and all those uh, individualized idiosyncratic uh, uh, services people need. We just have a couple minutes left. So let me just start with Aaron and then Bob and then Professor, Professor who think about as we look forward from Milwaukee, what you think of as either the biggest opportunity or the biggest threat um, as we think about coming out of COVID in 2021 and looking forward. Yeah, I've said for a long time, the, uh, the, the asset and the liability of Milwaukee is that it's so close to Chicago. And so figuring out how to maximize the advantage of, you know, proximity to Chicago while minimizing the disadvantages, uh, they realize it's a nebulous to do, uh, is one that I, I would definitely uh, be looking at, and certainly not in a facile way. Like everybody wants to just say, come to Indiana, our taxes are lower, right? Where I live. And it's like, save on your commute was the Wisconsin ad, you know, save 11 minutes on your commute. That's not why people move. And I don't think it's about trying to parasitize Illinois, but trying to find ways to take advantage. You know, I also lived in Providence, Rhode Island for a while, and it's the same situation, 50 miles from Boston, but its own little city. And how do you how do you how do you figure out how to, how to take advantage of that? I think it's the big strategic opportunity for Milwaukee to figure out. Thank you, Aaron. Bob. Well, uh, uh, Tim, I, uh, as far as biggest threats go, um, I have to give MMAC credit for working with the City Department of City Development for forming uh, essentially uh, the a rescue a COVID rescue fund for. Um, all of our, you know, small neighborhood uh, hospitality, food and beverage vendors, and uh, millions of dollars have been distributed um, to make sure that we don't forget the assets that make up the 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 uh, the heart of our city. And um, MMAC uh, was very instrumental in helping form that fund. Um, and and hats off to the city for allocating the funds for our hospitality, food and beverage players. So. Um, I think the biggest threat is forgetting the value of the underlying assets that make the urban experience so valuable and and so desirable. Um, the biggest opportunity we have, I think, is a, is uh, is uh, uh, some of what Professor uh, Hu was saying was that um, we have we have a this really rich in social environment and and physical environment as far as a metropolitan area goes. We have so much open space. We have so much public access to natural resources. And I think that the, the benefits of all of that has been 
uh, realize now in uh, during the pandemic when people had had few options and recreate you know recreational and health options they're out walking in the parks and biking and everything Re the biggest opportunity we have is a reinvestment in that whole infrastructure and an emphasis on that infrastructure in the way that we present the city um, to the marketplace that uh, that's that is our just a tremendous calling card that other cities just can't claim. Uh, we have an outsized benefit uh, with regard to those assets and we should play on it and, and, and build on that in the way that we present the city to others. Great, thank you. Professor Hu? Uh, the challenge, um, I, I mentioned it, I think the challenge is still segregation and the social justice issues and we need to change our image in that. Um, and we do have so many assets, as Ira and Bob said. And uh, I just want to add what I just thought of. I was in the national conference just last week, and I realized that because we have people from all four time zones, and the conference program used central time zone <laughs> as the indicator because we're not so far from east, we're not so far from the west coast. And I think that the central time zone probably is an advantage that we, we can play on so that we can easily coordinate teleconferences activities across the whole country. Professor, thank you very much. Uh, Bob, I appreciate always your expertise. And um, Aaron, we'll make sure people can uh, link to your Twitter account and, and follow you. I really appreciate you uh, providing some insights, uh, very interesting. And as a closing note, uh, in 1854, cholera wiped out 6% of Chicago's population. Yet by the end of that century, they had grown from 30,000 to 112,000. So while this is devastating, it's not new to urban markets. And I think the resilience of communities like Milwaukee um, are gonna be helped by the insights that you all have provided today. So thanks very much. Uh, we look forward to joining uh, everybody on uh, December 1st for our next program and then December 15th when we round out uh, the end of the year. So again, um, Aaron, Bob, Professor Hu, thank you very much for your insights today. Thank you for having us.